The nerve-wracking moment is over when you, I suddenly think there's going to be nobody left in this room. They've all gone to hear B. So thank you very much, those of you who've opted for this one. And um, some familiar faces. Um, I've done a similar presentation a couple of times now. So if you've been to uh, conferences or events where I've been speaking, some of this may be familiar territory. But uh, my plan is to, to talk for about 20 minutes or so uh, to give plenty of time for any questions or, or points that people want to make. Uh, and I apologise in advance because the title is probably slightly misleading. It says a progress update. Maybe it should be saying a lack of progress update <laughs> rather than a progress update. But I will try and uh, be as positive as possible about some of the things that have happened since uh, over the last 12 months. Yeah. So... So, first of all, let me just recap the uh, ESOL for Skills, which was a report produced by the Lifelong Education Institute, which is supported by the think tank I work for, Ray's Publica. And this came out at the beginning of the, uh, in fact, right at the end of last of 22. Uh, it was November or December, I can't remember exactly when. So it's almost exactly 12 months since the report came out. Um, and the report was, yeah, December 22, was sponsored by six organisations, four colleges, the Workers' Education Association, and Ascentis, who uh, very uh, kindly and usefully not only put some money into producing the report, but also gave me some really useful access to their data on ESOL, exam, take-up, et cetera, et cetera, enrolments across the country. So many thanks to Ascentis, and thanks for having me back. Um, it basically was a very straightforward key message that ESOL should be seen as a key part of tackling the skills issues that still bedevil this country. Skill shortages, skills gaps, we've been talking about them for some time. Most employers I talk to are still uh, quietly desperate about some of the recruitment challenges they face and the skills challenges they face. But ESOL had always previously been seen as something else. So it, 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 I'm preaching to the converted. It, it seems to me pretty obvious that greatly improved English is actually the major factor for mobilising immigrant skills. Uh, and this is not just basic English for survival, and we'll come back to that point in a moment, but English that's designed for competence in skilled jobs. So a, a, a higher level, if you like, of ESOL than we have been used to in many parts of the country. And I have to say this, and I'm, I'm, I have to say it still, uh, if anything, the immigration debate has got even more toxic than 12 months ago, if that's possible. Um, and we've seen over the last few weeks just what sort of rhetoric and politics is flying around the issue of any kind of immigration. It's become uh, inflammatory almost. It's uh, uh, extraordinary. But it means that we have to keep saying that there's no intrinsic conflict between an immigration system that's fair, firm, whatever you want, points-based, whatever, and a positive approach to integrating people who are entitled to be in this country. And the fact that I have to say that is slightly depressing, but uh, you do have to say it. And uh, I, I was saying to Sue, I've, I think I said this last time I, I talked uh, at an event, that uh, the standard format for uh, the Lifelong Education Institute is to produce a report and to get an MP or, or a minister from the government uh, to come and launch the report. The ESOL for Skills we couldn't find a single Conservative MP, let alone minister, who was prepared to attend the launch of a report promoting ESOL for skills. Despite the fact that privately many of them are sympathetic, they just weren't prepared in the political environment to be seen as somehow associated with something that might be interpreted as supporting immigration. 
uh, and, and that's the sad fact of the matter. We, we had a fantastic, uh, uh, we had the Labour MP, Marsha de Cordova, uh, came and, uh, and helped us out. So uh, uh, we did have a great event, but it was extraordinary. Anyway, look, um, w we'll probably touch on the politics uh, a little bit more as we go on. There were eight key recommendations, an ESOL strategy for England, um, Everybody else has got one. Scotland's got one. Wales has got one. Lots of other countries have one. We have been talking about having one for years. We still haven't got one. Uh, and the second one was what, what, what was described in the report as a settlement positive strategy for everybody seeking citizenship in the UK. And we put after six months because, of course, technically speaking, the government target is that anybody applying for refugee or asylum status has six months for their claim to be processed. In practice, that doesn't happen, as you're probably well aware, but, but that's the target. And that means that people sometimes are left for months and sometimes years uh, in, in, a, in, in a sort of twilight zone where they can't access uh, necessary training, including ESOL. So we said, look, six months, it's up to you to get your queue sorted out. These people need to have something after at least uh, six months is the deadline. Full funding for, uh, uh, for ESOL, um, uh, 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 up to and including level two. Uh, we, we argued that there needs to be fatter courses, if you like, that the hours that are allocated are not sufficient. Uh, and all the evidence internationally, as again, I'm talking to the converted, is that you need a lot more hours of English than is actually being funded in this country to get to the levels we're talking about. <laughs> Specific support funding for ESOL students. Again, many colleges struggle to provide support, particularly for those whose uh, citizenship status hasn't been resolved. Uh, and I, I've come across many lecturers and colleagues who do all sorts of extraordinary things on the side to try and help students. That's not good enough. ESOL students are entitled to the same level of student support as others, is our argument. And then moving it on a bit, we, we, the, the, one of the issues is the lack of continuity, if you like, the fact that for a learner to progress from basic English through to the levels of English required, for example, to do a university course, you need a lot more. Uh, and so we suggested bespoke access for HE courses for, uh, for ESOL students. Uh, so access to HE is an obvious route. There are other ways of doing it. Uh, ESOLs to be a specific strand in the local strategic improvement plans, and we'll return to that in a moment, and ESOL uh, being a component of vocational training in priority sectors. And again, we'll return to that briefly. So th th those were the recommendations, not, not, not exactly proverbial rocket science, but there they were. So look, just very briefly, um, the immigrant population is growing it appears that that trend is continuing. 30% growth in the number of immigrants in this country between Census 2011 and Census 2021. Uh, and now in the UK, those people who uh, report that they were not born in the UK, and these of course may not all be ESOL speakers, these are, these are people who are just not born in the UK, 16% of the population, a high proportion of people living in this country uh, are now not British born. 91% have English as the main language, 78% in London. And London is, like other cities, rather different in its composition. So uh, of the, uh, those, th those 9% uh, or 22% in London who are not native English speakers, 17% report they can't speak well, 3% report they have no English at all. So that's 20% of the 9% that, uh, that, that don't have English as a main language. There is no evidence on the level of written English. Nobody collects that. Uh, and just a, another insight from a different direction, 19% of school pupils, and this was a year ago, it may have changed, but I haven't looked recently, need English as additional language support. 
So 20% roughly of the school population also have English language needs. I mean, again, this is nothing extraordinary, but the need is not going away. And from the latest statistics on net migration, it looks as if the trend, if anything, is accelerating rather than decelerating, regardless of all the political heat and steam that's uh, going off around it. We are getting more people uh, who are not necessarily English speakers arriving in this country. So look, at the time of writing the report, the local strategic improvement plans were something that were being worked on. So I can now answer, to some extent, that first question. Has the ESOL issue been picked up by local strategic improvement plans, which certainly from our perspective would be the most obvious and direct way of integrating ESOL into the skills strategy of different areas across the country. If that's going to be the mechanism, the LSIT, then ESOL needs to be in there. And, of course, uh, and, and I'll, I'll say a little bit, because I say we've got some of the answers as the LSIPs are now all finalised. The difficulty is there's a lot of them. I'm trying to work through them. They're, they're very big as well, some of them. Um, uh, there are still skill shortages in many sectors. Uh, I was talking a few months ago to the chair, believe it or not, of the British Poultry Council, a well-known organisation uh, for those who like chicken, but they also cover ducks, turkeys and other sorts of edible fowl, so there we are. Uh, and, and they're desperate. I mean, uh, uh, they're facing a crisis because 62% of their workforce pre-Brexit was EU, and they just can't find people. It, it, but young people, young English youngsters in this country who, who want to pluck, uh, strangle and you know, chop up chickens for some reason, which means that uh, 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 we're facing a Christmas where a lot of you, if you are into chicken and turkey, will be eating imported chicken and turkey because we just can't produce it in this country. So those are the sorts of impacts uh, that uh, Brexit and that the immigration policies and all the other things combined, the pandemic, all these various things uh, have, have led to a situation where we've got major skill shortages, not just in poultry, but, you know, hospitality, care, the National Health Service, etc., etc. And there's no sign yet of any national strategy that refers to ESOL coming forward from anywhere at the moment. Um, uh, we've just had the introduction of further curbs on the families of some categories of international students, those who are doing uh, taught uh, PhDs and MAs and so on. We don't know because it's only just come in what the impact of that will be, but it doesn't seem at the moment to be having much effect on the numbers coming in. And this is an interesting one and one which I keep asking every time I speak, uh, I get different messages about whether there is a shortage of skilled ESOL lecturers or there isn't a shortage of skilled ESOL lecturers. Uh, and I have asked and said, well, do we know if there's a shortage or not? Maybe it is variable across the country. I don't know. But if anybody has any information on, on the staffing issue, uh, certainly the college that I'm now chair of at Barking and Dagenham, w w w the, we are struggling uh, at that college to find uh, staff uh, who are appropriately qualified, trained, etc., etc. So um, in East London, it certainly seems to be an issue, but I'm really not quite sure uh, what's happening around the country. So look, this is my attempt as an update. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a very big update because there isn't a great deal to say. I've already said the problem is uh, there's a great big cloud hanging over ESOL because of this highly politicised uh, way in which immigration is talked about. Um, and the, uh, the, the level of emotion uh, and the high-stakes politics doesn't make it easy to have a rational discussion in this environment. Um, and I don't see that changing uh, until there is at least a change of government uh, of some sort. And if it was to be another Conservative government, I suspect that that will continue because, as we can see, there is a very strong section of Conservative supporters who are very, very fixated on this immigration issue, as if it's some sort of existential issue for the country. 
Um, some LSIPs have picked up the issue. And I'm very pleased uh, uh, to see that the local strategic improvement plans, particularly those I've seen in urban areas, have definitely <coughs> focused on ESOL as part of the strategy. So Greater Manchester, West Midlands, etc. Now I have to confess, because there's 43 of these LSIPs, uh, I, I'm told that somebody is going to come out, uh, I think the, uh, somebody said the DFE ha has got an AI machine that's going to go through them all and come up with a, a one-page version of each one, which, which will be interesting. But, but the, at the moment, you have to read the whole lot, and, and most of them are quite weighty documents. So I've managed to have a look at the London ones, uh, there are four of them, because London of the size of London. And I'm pleased to say that very strongly picked up in three out of the four London LSIPs. So uh, the, the only one it doesn't get picked up as strongly is central London. But in West London, very, very prominent. Not surprising, because West London has a very high proportion of potential ESOL students. Uh, and in South London and in local London, which is basically the East, uh, there's a whole section on ESOL. So it's been picked up quite consistently. The next step for me, when I get the time, is to either find somebody who's reviewed the LSIPs, and there are a couple of people, one from the AOC, uh, one from the DFE, who are working on this, to see the extent to which ESOL is beginning to be seen as part of the skills agenda, and that will be interesting. Probably be another two or three months before we can, we can be sure about that. Certainly, uh, if you look at the combined authorities and the devolved areas, it certainly is the case, even in areas like Cambridge and Peterborough, which are relatively non-urban, if you like to put it like that, in most of the combined authorities, ESOL has certainly been raised as a prominent issue. Uh, so the Greater London uh, Skills Roadmap, uh, which came out about a year ago, talked about improving the coordination of ESOL. And those of us working in London know already that uh, the GLA funding it actually enables you to provide ESOL for asylum seekers as well as others, which isn't the case in other parts of the country, although one or two other areas have picked that up. So I suppose the good news is that ESOL is beginning to start registering as a skill need in the local skills improvement plans. The workshop I went to, which was in West London, uh, there were a number of employers who were saying, look, we, we have a workforce in, in our factory or our plant. They must speak 30 different languages. You know, they're really motivated. They're good. But we have problems in communications. We have problems in written reports. We really need somebody to get, you know, better productivity, if you like, out of the people we've got. We, we, we need more support for English. Um, and uh, uh, anecdotally, I'm pleased to say that uh, Barkey and Dagenham, like many of you are doing, are, are now back to running what used to be the case much more frequently, which is uh, workshops at, at nine in the evening to those who are on work shift patterns that mean that that's the best time for them to get their classes. So, you know, that flexible approach, that flexible delivery is exactly what employers are wanting. I would argue that we've been, um, there's been too many hurdles to do that easily, uh, and we need to do more to get rid of those hurdles. So, um, the LSIPs is good. That's, that's a promising sign. And uh, I have to be careful. I don't want in any sense to be party political, because that's not my job. But uh, it certainly seems to be the case that those authorities which are Labour or Lib Dem administered tend to be more sympathetic and more supportive of the ESOL strategy than those that aren't. Not always the case, and I don't want to make a, a, a you know, it's not an either or, but in general, uh, uh, that is the case. And that means my uh, uh, forecast at the moment is that if we were to get a Labour government in the next general election, there are more chances that we will make progress in terms of a better ESOL strategies, because the Labour Party, although it said nothing specific about ESOL recently, in general has on the ground been more supportive of ESOL development, expansion and funding. But we'll see, because of course that, uh, 
that problem at the top there of immigration being such a politicised issue might actually even restrain a Labour government from doing some of the things that we think need to be done. Net migration figures continue to rise. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I despair because um, uh, they lump into net migration all sorts of different categories of person. When you start looking at it, actually the headline figures can be quite misleading. So international students, uh, of whom less than 1% stay on after they finish their studies, are all lumped into the net migration uh, for all sorts of technical reasons. Um, and honestly, uh, they are not people who are going to be staying in this country, 99 point something percent of them. So it just bumps up the figure unnecessarily. And in with all the ones that people seem to get obsessed with, this idea that there are thousands of people in small boats, when you look at the actual proportion of asylum and refugee, uh, asylum seekers and refugees, it's not big at all compared to the overall figures, most of whom are people coming for jobs in perfectly reasonable and orderly fashion. Um, this year, I, I'd be interested to hear from anybody here, certainly from London AOC, the information we've got is that ESOL has spiked considerably. Massive enrolment. Uh, in, in a number of colleges, more than a 20% increase in the number of ESOL enrolments. Uh, and certainly at Barkey and Dagenham, there's been a big increase, not quite as big as that, but certainly a big increase in the number of enrolments. So the demand is there, absolutely no doubt with that. Um, and I say I'd be interested to, if anybody has any information about what's happening in other parts of the country in terms of enrolment. I've mentioned the ESOL teacher shortages. I think they are, um, you know, it, 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 in one of them, in particular, the uh, local London uh, LSIP, the Local Strategic um, Improvement Plan, spends quite some time worrying about the lack of uh, skilled ESOL teachers. Not, none of the others spend so much time on it, but it does seem to be picked up uh, in certain areas, as I've said. And uh, we still don't have any sign of a national strategy after all this time. So I'm afraid there's not a great deal that can be said about that. All I can say is that there's been, uh, and this was yesterday, so this is, I haven't even had a chance to put it on here, that the Bell Foundation have come out um, and there was a blog uh, yesterday uh, from one of their team saying that they uh, are pushing for a review of the ESOL curriculum and the blog that I saw said the DfE had agreed to this. And when you look at what they're trying to do with this review of the ESOL curriculum, it is about trying to make it more vocationally focused, in essence. So they are pushing down the curriculum route and claim that they've got support from the DfE and QAA. And that would be interesting because that would open up another front, if you like, in, in this general move to try and make ESOL more vocationally relevant uh, and to try and uh, ensure that the curriculum has the space, the time and the resourcing to be able to develop higher level skills, English skills, vocational English skills and academic English skills for ESOL learners. So there's signs, but this again is the Bell Foundation, which is a, a champion of these things. Uh, but if the DfE have said yes, and I haven't been able to check that yet to a review, then that would be at least some movement in the situation and some prospect of improvement. So, ESOL for skills. Uh, it, it's an obvious phrase. It's something that I think we shouldn't be debating uh, in, in a political context. It, I, I, and I know I'm talking to people who are likely to agree, but it just seems so obvious, doesn't it, that if you arrive in this country uh, and you're of working age, you will have an aspiration to actually be part of a productive economy. And the benefits of getting people engaged in that for the economy, for the individuals, for their families, for the benefit system, for social integration and community cohesion, for all sorts of reasons. It's something that I think should be a high priority for a government of any colour. And I just repeat again, it's nothing to do 
with what you think should be the best immigration system or not. It's to do with actually taking a positive attitude towards those who have made the journey to join British economy and society legally and properly. And there are thousands and thousands of those, as you know, in that category. So there we are, hats off to all of you who are, who are battling in a, a, a situation where I would describe it as being one where the funding and other rules and regulations are sometimes barriers rather than enhancers of the teaching you're trying to do, but you're doing a great job. And the one thing I never hear anywhere is ESOL students or anybody saying, oh, this isn't being done very well. What a poor standard of ESOL. In general, the quality of what's being offered is very good. We just need more of it. And at that point, I'm happy to take questions and uh, any points that anybody might have. Thank you. Now, I saw a hand waving. Um, yeah, I can see one there. Sorry, I don't know names, yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, so, just to kind of answer some of the questions that you mentioned, the Lancashire yeah. LSIP doesn't mention ESOL. Uh, um, great. So, having <laughs> just done a, a control... Now you've upset me now. Sorry, a control <laughs> yeah, Okay. You've upset us. We were worried about the other, the government, weren't we? We were like, it's depressing <laughs> us now. Let's not talk about yeah. that. Um, and also... Um, Yes, we do have a recruitment issue. Um, so we we could deliver more ESOL provision if we had more money to be able to deliver more ESOL, which would then result in us being able to advertise and hopefully recruit and train our own ESOL tutors. Um, so I think kind of your question about have we got a shortage? We do in Lancashire, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, I, I, my, my God, Lancashire, for goodness' sake, you know. The, 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 Unless Lancashire's changed a lot since I last was there, I mean, good, the, the need is obvious. So, absolutely. I mean, I, I specifically cover Blackburn with Darwin, which is a, um, a part of Lancashire, but the Lancashire LSIP covers um, the whole of Blackburn with Darwin, which, um, uh, if anybody knows Lancashire, Blackburn is um, an area of high level of need in terms of the RESOL provision. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the fact that I've just had a quick control and F yeah. to find ESOL in the strategy and it's not there. Yeah. Well, I'll just make one comment. If there's any opportunity for anybody uh, in any of the areas to actually point this out and say, why isn't it there, then I think that would be useful. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there another hand? I saw some... No, a phantom hand. Yeah, there's one here. I, I reckon that... Huh? Sorry, I was just ah, going to say... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, just the other day, we had a, um, a paper sent from Natekla, which was from the Bell Foundation, asking for our input about the curriculum review, and the deadline is the 8th of December. Oh, is it? So ah. that's what I've, yeah, I've just checked. I haven't done it myself yet either, but if anybody does want to comment, they might want to do that short, sooner rather than later. Than okay, well, that is a tight deadline, because yeah. this only, I only saw this yesterday, the 27th of November, so... Um, they're wanting a quick turnaround. I, I, I think it would be useful, if you can, uh, to go on the Bell Foundation website and, uh, and have a look. can't remember the name of the person. Shalekin, I think. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the, uh, Thank you, Andy. Good nice to see to you again. Nice to see you, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for the update on the lack of progress, <laughs> uh, by the yes. way. Yes. Um, just a question in terms of actually the progress of learners in these all provision onto mainstream vocational. We seem to lack some data on that, which would be a good way to present a fuller picture to those who make those decisions in terms of funding ESOL and, and um, you know, demonstrating that actually and anecdotally ESOL learners do particularly well when they move on to main programs. Is there any update on that front? Thank you. Uh, we were getting on so well. Uh, uh, now you asked that question. Uh, I, I, I tried. I, I mean, the, 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 the problem is, as you're probably aware, is that trying to isolate ESOL speakers from other basic skills, English, functional skills, and because of the way in which a lot of ESOL learners find themselves on non-ESOL 
described courses, functional skills and all sorts of things, GCSE, etc. It's actually incredibly difficult. Uh, you, you, you can't just pull the data off. You have to crunch the data manually to try and extract those who you would describe as a genuine ESOL students as opposed to those who have basic literacy needs for other reasons. So the, the simple answer is no. It would be incredibly useful, but it would require somebody to do some you know, frontline primary research. Uh, to be honest, even if one college did it, it would be useful because I couldn't find anything uh, that, that answered that question. My perception is that quite a good proportion of ESOL learners do progress to university, onto good jobs, et cetera, et cetera, but we just don't have the evidence base at the moment. It's a gap. And that's part of the problem with not having a strategy or any sort of resourcing around this, uh, that there's no pressure to, to collect data of that sort. Yeah. So it, it, it's not available. It's a, it, it's a tough challenge. Yes, I can see a, a, a finger, not a hand, a finger there. Yeah. I was just wondering, I might have missed it, but um, I haven't seen any discussion around the lines when uh, funding, I, uh, I feel uh, that funding is one-sided. It's focused on learners only, whereas ESOL teachers are different from English or functional skills in, in, uh, in this uh, way that uh, we um, uh, get in contact with many learners who have, uh, you know, migrated from war zones, um, uh, teens who are carrying all sorts of uh, traumas with them, and there, there is no funding or do, no discussion about training the ESOL teachers to deal with uh, or support them. Otherwise, all these efforts of integrating them could backfire. So without that training. So is there any discussion about that that I haven't heard? Or if there is none, can we put that forward as a point? Thank you. Yeah, no, very good point. Uh, uh, and I sort of touched on it when I was talking about the need for dedicated specific support for ESOL students. And you're quite right. Uh, many of them have come from traumatic situations, natural disasters, wars, uh, you know, d d various forms of discrimination. But apart, even if they haven't come from that sort of situation, having to cope with, uh, you know, how many of us have had to relocate to a completely different cultural environment with a different system to understand the benefit system, to understand the health system? Uh, I, I find it difficult enough to understand the health system, let alone, uh, bit, and I've been living in the country. So there are all sorts of really stressful things that somebody new to the country needs to have help with. And I know, as I've said, that a lot of people informally will give people advice, will signpost them to local charities and support services, etc. But I think you're quite right. There isn't enough resource. There isn't enough training for people. It's not, uh, um, you know, it's not common sense ha how you talk to somebody who, who, who has been in a war zone is uh, you know, not something that we just naturally know how to do. So I think you're absolutely right. There's a prima facie argument for better training for ESOL staff, uh, not just in terms of their ability to deliver the language skills, but their ability to help the students settle in, focus, et cetera, et cetera. I, I do have to say, and it's, it's a, it's a, you have to be careful, I do have to say that I think um, one of the unsung things about many ESOL lecturers and admissions staff and all sorts of people is the voluntary time and effort they put in to doing this, despite the fact they get nothing for it, if you like, you know. Um, but but that, that's not good enough, uh, uh, and obviously means it, it's variable, depending on the individuals involved. So I, I think that's a big issue. Uh, language is obviously the obvious barrier, but there are many other barriers, uh, you're nodding away, that, that people have to cope with. Uh, it, uh, and I'm trying to remember the phrase. Someone said that a language, it's not just learning a language. Through learning a language, and your language teachers, I'm not. Through learning a language, you're also learning a different culture. Uh, and I think that is very important in relation to ESOL as much as anything else. Yeah. 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 Hi, Andy. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, 
One of the issues we found is we're trying to, I'm an adult from an adult learning provider, an ESOL coordinator, trying to set up partnerships with employers. Um, it's the funding, it's the funding issue. They, I, you know, without being disingenuous, they want something for free. Yep. Um, so yep. the problem is, for example, I've got a, a, a partnership with Stoke Mandeville Hospital at the moment. Yep. The NHS has no spare m money. So um, we're delivering ESOL to all their porters, their domestics, their cleaners yeah. and so on. Um, but I've had to go through functional skills route. It's not the right route for those particular group of students, but it's the only way because they're all earning you know, with overtime and whatever, just above the threshold to get funded, to get fully funded, mm. there's no money for the employer. Um, mm. And as I say, they want it for free. So I just wonder, has there been any sort of research on sort of looking at how creative we've had to be <laughs> to get in ESOL into the workplaces? Um, and is there any sort of movement further towards full funding? I know you're asking for it. Do you see that something that might happen in the, in the near future? Well, uh, no is the simple answer. <laughs> no, I, I think that uh, in the devolved authorities, the GLA and others, uh, there is now a better approach to funding in those areas. Better, not perfect. I, I haven't talked a great deal about funding, mainly because Beej is talking about that somewhere else and I'm not an expert. But, but it, it's quite obvious that there just isn't enough in the system to, to meet the needs. How are we going to get there? Well, I think it's one of those other aspects where, uh, especially with employers, where they do expect uh, that they actually are quite surprised when you say, well, there isn't money for this. You know, they, they say, oh, you know, so you're going to have to find some resource. Now, I, I think that it would be perfectly possible, I'm saying this carefully, because under the current system, employers actually have to sponsor people, fill in lots of paperwork to get people from overseas to work for them. You could easily integrate a system which meant that you don't just get people, you also provide them with language and other training, and that's part of the commitment you make, and that's part of what you're paying for, if you like. You could, you could come up with a system where employers contributed, in other words, to, to this. And, and, and some of them would especially those that are desperate, let's face it. The, 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 there's nothing that you can do, though, and I've come across this. I won't mention where it was, it down in southwest near Bristol, where, where you have a, an organisation which has people on very low wages, very poor shifts, uh, not prepared to spend a penny, etc., and then wants to have them all trained up to a very high standard of English. I mean, that's just... You, they're asking for something which is just not possible, uh, and they haven't invested properly in the workforce. But it, it's an example of, of a problem we've got uh, across the board, is uh, many employers just don't put enough money into uh, support and training for their own workforce. So, sorry, I, don't, I, 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 I can't detect anything at the moment. And I said, even if we got a change of government and somebody who was more positive came in, the economic situation and the sorts of pressures on public services mean that it's not obvious that we would get more funding. I think we'd have more possibilities, but from my memory of previous changes of government, often it takes two or three years before they feel confident enough to, to start spending money in ways that are different from before. So I think we've got to wait, I'm afraid. Um, um, yeah. Aha, I can see a gentleman over there in the, on the wing. Uh, hi, Andy. Uh, I'll try and make these quick answers to your questions and then something to share. Oh, good. Uh, so East Sussex, LSIP, it's not, ESO is not in there, but it's teetering on the edge of it because it does talk about transferable skills a lot. Uh -huh. which is ESOL cuts right the way through that. So I think we might be able to get it, we might be able to push it over next time. Uh, yeah, we also have a shortage of teachers in, in uh, East Sussex for qualified ESOL teachers. So we're getting, getting sort of people from EF, EFL backgrounds coming in, retraining them. Uh, but something to share, a colleague there talking about trauma, that is for all of us an increasing problem. Mm -hmm. And it's been managed by the fact that ESOL staff tend to be just amazing staff who put in lots of extra hours doing pastoral work, uh, employability skills, trauma, all kinds of things, housing, access. Uh, because we're driven by that and by the, the new Ofsted focus on personal development, access to personal development for all, for adults, not just 16 to 19, we are going to be using ALS funding, AEB funding basically, to create 
personal development and well-being tutors, i.e. pastoral tutors for mm. ESOL, which I think our MIS team feel mm. we're pushing the envelope a bit. But if you don't know, um, if, if you, have to, you have to have an assessment to say that the student has a, some kind of barrier to learning. Yeah. It can't just be language. You can't say every ESOL yeah. student. PTSD would be a barrier to learning. And then you'll get 150 quid for each student that is seen, if they're seen for a minimum of one hour per month. And well, using that, you can calculate how you yeah. can afford to employ somebody. Yeah, good. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily cover everybody because of the difficulties with those who haven't had their citizenship, etc. But it will cover a, a proportion, quite a high proportion, I'd imagine. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Really, yeah. Okay, look, it, it is 2.15. You were promised a break. Um, I, I, I hope you found that useful. Now, I would be really, really happy to be invited back in a year's time to be able to have some actual progress to report as opposed to not much progress. But, but, le but let's see. Uh, and in the meantime, I think that there's, uh, the good news is I think there's more and more consensus around the need to move this on. So I think the voices are getting louder, and as I said before, the more you can push locally, within your colleges, within your adult education organisations, with the uh, local employers, with the local skills improvement plans, etc., I think the better, uh, and try and get the, the music getting louder and louder uh, it to be settlement positive for ESOL students. Thank you very much. Thank you.